Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm going to begin the second game in the uh, Frogwares Sherlock Holmes series. And when I say second game, I mean chronologically. We began with Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, which takes place in the heady year of 1879 or 1880. And Sherlock Holmes was a mere fresh-faced 21-year-old, if I remember correctly. The chronological order I'm going to be taking the games in is in part from their apparent subject matter but largely also from this blog post here from the comic odyssey uh, which was posted before chapter one was actually released but does include that so our timeline begins at 1869 with the death of violet holmes the game itself takes place about 10 years after that uh, or 11 years i think it's 1880 if i remember correctly which means that in chronological order, our next stop is 1888, less than 10 years after Chapter 1. You can see that uh, it was a rough 10 years for old Sherlock Holmes, but this game is, <laughs> is next in the list. Uh, Frogwares apparently evolved their uh, vision of Sherlock Holmes in that time. This one, we can also be sure, takes place in 1888, because it is Sherlock versus Jack the Ripper taking from that famous case. So we know, indeed, the year must be 1888. Now, I have not looked into the game or read any reviews or anything. I don't really care about that. If I'm bored with it, I'll simply move on. Um, but uh, do know that this is a bit long in the tooth now. This is, what, 2007? Let's say 2009. 2009. So I don't know what to expect, but this was a great deal uh, of time um, where Frogwares, I'm not sure all of the mechanics of the game necessarily were developed yet. So um, we'll see. We'll see what it's like. Give it a try. Maybe we won't complete it. Again, it depends. Um, but I did finish most of Chapter 1, so I'm going into this intending to finish at least most of all of the games, as long as they are playable in this day and age. So let's start the game up and get to it. All right, well, we certainly have a little bit of work to do here before we get started. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to solve... Okay, yes, can solve the screen resolution issue. Well, not like that. Um, yeah, something other... A... All right, let's try... All right, I think I've done all I can do, so let's get started. In the name of my health and yours, Holmes, stop smoking so much. There is more fog in our apartment than in the street. You are right, Watson, but this evening is never ending and I have nothing to do but make smoke rings. A more amusing pastime would suit better, but my doctor is against it. Perhaps a little tune on the violin. My heart is not in it tonight, Watson. Have you noticed how this cigarette burns? Would you not say it is like a life being consumed? How many lives will end tonight in London? How many crimes will be committed within the life of a single cigarette? Ah, the vanity of existence. It is but complaints and smoke, the meager panache of its sickly soul. The tobacco is giving you very somber thoughts. I am certain that this inactivity will not last. Let's retire. You'll be in better humor tomorrow. Reason speaks. Let's to bed. Okay. Sherlock is far more emo than I recall.
I mean, it does look every bit of 2009, doesn't it? Luckily, you know, games like this, at least for me, are not about the graphics, obviously. It's a mystery game. It's about the investigation and the puzzle. And as long as those are fun, it shouldn't be a problem. This way, my lovely. We'll have a right good time. If this time. is meant to be uh, the first victim of Sherlock Holmes, if I remember you. correctly, that would be a Polly or a Polly Nichols. Oh, uh, Mary Ann that's Nichols. my hair that pleases you. Difficulty subduing her, it seems, didn't take very much. Big Street, September 1st, 1888. The news is as dark as the sky, Holmes. An inquest has been opened into the murder of a poor woman in the East End. The unfortunate girl was discovered last night, lying in the street, still warm. The murderer was filled with an incredible savagery. Oh, the article gave me shivers down my spine. The inspectors in charge of the case don't seem to have even the slightest lead. A similar murder took place less than a month ago. Ah, love. A romantic walk, a kiss in the moonlight, a polite refusal, a terrible anger and a hanging. This area of Whitechapel is a disgrace to London. The government should take serious note of what is going on there. Whitechapel? This woman was found in Whitechapel? Yes, indeed. Bucks Row, to be specific. Then it was not a question of romance, but of commerce. Unless these women actually take pleasure in the vice, the female nature is completely... Holmes, do you hear yourself? A woman is dead under unspeakable circumstances. No less than any other, she was a human and one of Her Majesty's subjects. None of these streetwalkers of which you speak have any other way to survive but by selling their bodies. You know as well as I that our era is not a gentle one, and these women don't have much to look forward to. Some grace, if you would. Do not refuse them your compassion. Do not say another word, my dear Watson. We shall leave immediately for Whitechapel. To the scene of the crime? No, I think it would be better to arrive there a bit later once night has fallen. At the moment, the spot will be overrun by police officers and spectators. It would be impossible to investigate properly. Then where are we going, Holmes? The best thing to do would be to head to the police station and attempt to get a copy of the preliminary reports. But the article in the Star seemed quite complete to me. You must know, Watson, that journalists often draw conclusions from the facts without a proper understanding of how to do this delicate task. We must obtain the reports from the inspector in charge, as well as those from the coroner. Very well, Holmes, but all the same. It seems to me that I have a map of London somewhere, Watson. Can you find it and locate Whitechapel while I get ready? Hmm. You are too kind, Holmes. Searching through your mess? Okay, this appears to be our case book, similar to Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1. I can already see that uh, there's um, a number of uh, mechanics that seem to have carried forward throughout the years, um, so hopefully this won't be too different from Chapter 1. Um, I should uh, preface this playthrough here uh, by saying that I am quite familiar with the uh, Jack the Ripper case just as a personal curiosity um, I wouldn't say that I have encyclopedic knowledge of it um, I guess first and foremost I am somewhat uncomfortable with a game using actual real-life murders as part of its fiction um, you know these were people there was an actual killer they actually died um, 
and I'm not necessarily comfortable with using that as entertainment. That said, it was 1888, and this game is certainly not the first to ever, you know, take even a sensationalized version of the story and use it. It's been used in fiction, well, since 1888, to be honest with you. Um, but that said, I don't necessarily feel like it's right to do that. But, um, you know, like I said, this game's not the first. I don't lay that at the feet of Frogwares. It's just more more of a general note. Um, let's see. Uh, before we get started, one thing I also want to mention is that um, 1888, of course, was long, long before many of our modern investigatory techniques were um, really developed. A lot of our forensic techniques were really developed. This was the age where reason in investigations was burgeoning, but a time, criminologically speaking, that there's a very different attitude about crimes and criminals. And so um, there have been many people that continue to this day to investigate the Jack the Ripper murders. So much time, of course, has passed. It's very unlikely we'll ever actually draw any true conclusions. But if you do have an interest in the case, and you do have an interest in true crime or criminal profiling, John Douglas um, actually did a profile on Jack the Ripper, which is available on the FBI's website. John Douglas is one of the uh, first people uh, that originally developed the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, which essentially developed what is now today modern-day criminal profiling. Um, also, John Douglas very famously um, wrote a book called Mind Hunters. Uh, he is sensationalized in his own fictional accounts with the Netflix TV series Mind Hunters. Um, also, inspiration for many of modern day true crime fiction, such as Silence of the Lambs and so on. Um, so, if you are interested in the Jack the Ripper case and you want to try and read something that's a little bit unique as far as the fictionalized accounts or what have you. I can't recommend that uh, profile enough. As a matter of fact, uh, no, I won't pull it up for you. Just search for it. John Douglas, Jack the Ripper profile. You'll find it. It's on the FBI website. I'm not going to read through it with you. We got a game to play here. Anyway, let's get to it. So, uh, The Star, London's uh, Saturday, September 1st, 18... Wait, Saturday, September 1st? That doesn't seem right. Uh, I was just about to fact check whether or not that was a Saturday, but I, I'm not going to. Um, that's way too much detail. <laughs> Special edition, the White Chapter, White Chapel Horror, the third crime of a man who must be a maniac. Okay, so that was the third crime that we were witnessing. Hmm. Women lured to buy streets to be butchered, the latest victim identified, opening of the inquest, great local excitement. The victim of the latest Whitechapel horror, a woman who was found yesterday morning in Bucks Row, completely disemboweled and with her head nearly gashed from her body, was for a time completely unknown. As the news of the murders spread, however, first one woman and then another came forward to view the body, and at length it was found that a woman answering the description of the murdered woman had lodged in a common lodging house, 18 Thrall Street, Spatial Field. Spit... Spit... Talfield? Spittlefields? What a name for a place. Spittlefields. Women from that place were fetched and they identified the deceased as Polly. Okay, so that was supposed to be Mary Ann Nichols. Who had shared a room with three other women in the place on the usual terms. So, um, the boarding house they're talking about here in Victorian London around this time. Uh, lodging was for the lower classes was almost always public. Um, but um, many of the initial victims of Jack the Ripper were so poor that the accommodations they could f afford were known as petty, uh, sorry, penny sit-ups. Penny sit-ups. Where basically you wouldn't even get a room, you wouldn't get a bed, you would get uh, a spot on a pew, and then they would string a rope around chest height in front of the pew so that you could lean against the rope and get some sleep. And that is partly why they were attacked on the street. Jack the Ripper's final victim, which I'm assuming we'll get to here, actually did have her own room, her own private quarters, and that's why Jack the Ripper was able to take so much more time, essentially all night, with her committing his crime, um, leading to the most brutal of the crime scenes. Um, but she had a room with three other women in the place on the... <clears throat> 
usual terms of such houses nightly payment of four d each each woman having a separate bed it was gathered that the deceased had led the life of an unfortunate lodging in that house which was only for about three weeks past nothing more was known of her by them but that when she presented herself for her lodging on thursday night she was turned away by the deputy because she had not the money she was then the worse for drink but not drunk and turned away laughing saying i'll soon get my dos money see what a jolly bonnet i've got now she was wearing a bonnet which she had not been seen with before and left the lodging house door a woman of the neighborhood saw her later she told police even as late as half past two on friday morning in whitechapel road um opposite the church and at the corner of osborne street and at the quarter of four she was found within 500 yards of the spot murdered the people of the lodging house knew her as polly but at about half past this is a lot of text to go through but he, but at about half past seven late last evening a woman named mary ann monk a present at present an inmate of lambeth workhouse was taken to the mortuary and identified the body as that of mary ann nichols also called polly nichols she knew her she said and they were inmates of the lambeth workhouse together in april and may last year the deceased having been passed there from another workhouse on 12 may according to monk nichols left the workhouse to take a situation as a servant at ingleside wandsworth common it was afterwards became known that nichols betrayed her trust as a domestic servant by stealing three pound from her uh from her employer and absconding <clears throat> from that time she had been wandering about monk met her she said about six weeks ago when herself out of the workhouse and drank with her she was sure the deceased was polly nichols and having twice viewed the features as a body lay in a shell maintained in her opinion there is a terribly significant similarity between this ghastly crime and the two mysterious murders of women which have occurred in the same district in the last three months in each case the victim has been a woman of abandoned character each crime has been committed in the dark hours of the morning, and more important, still has pointing to one man. Still has pointing to one man, and that man a maniac, being the culprit of each murder, has been accompanied by hideous mutilation. In the second case, that of a woman, Martha Turner, it will be remembered that no, no, no fewer than 30 stabs were inflicted. The scene of this murder was George Yard, a place appropriately known locally as the Slaughterhouse. As in both of the cases, there was in this not the slightest clue to the murder. No one was known to have any motive for causing the woman's death. She was parted from her husband and had lived with a man named Turner, but the searching, but, but the searching coroner's inquiry revealed nothing connecting either with the crime. It was fancied that some of her how many wounds had been caused by a bayonet and she was said to have been seen with a soldier shortly before her death some soldiers were paraded at the tower and one was said to have been identified by a policeman as having been waiting about george yard just about the time of the murder but nothing came of it the first murder which strangely enough did not rouse much interest was committed in osborne street the woman in that case was alive when discovered but con unconscious and she died in the hospital without covering her senses consequently she was unable to whisper a word to put the police on the track of her fiendish assailant and her murder has remained a mystery all three crimes have been committed within a very small radius each of the ill-lighted thoroughfares to which the women were de decoyed to be <clears throat> to be foully butchered are off turnings from Whitechapel Road, and all are within half mile. The fact that these three tragedies have been committed within such a limited area and are so strangely alike in their death details is forcing on all minds the conviction that they are the work of some cool, cunning man with a mania for murder. There was no new light thrown on the case this morning. At nine o'clock, the body of the deceased was removed to the mortuary in an improvised operating room on the premises, and Dr. Ralph Llewellyn made a post-mortem examination. The body of the examination, or sorry, the object of the examination was to determine if possible the order in which the various cuts were made it is evident from the cuts in the throat that the head was bent back by the murderer before the knife was used whether the other mutilation took place before or after death remains to be settled as also the position in which the woman lay when the deed was done there are several questions of this kind which may throw light on the case notably a small quantity of blood at the place where she was found and the fact that there must have been much of it somewhere else at present clues to the murder are entirely lacking and the location of the place where the deed was done was the first point necessary to establish 
and that's the end. Okay, that was a lot of text. I certainly hope that the game doesn't throw so much text at us to read to do this, because I'm not into that. Uh, notes don't contain any new items. They are only meant to expound upon the facts already stated. The dialogue here, and it's a transcript of conversations. We have no items. Um, another map. Missing first person perspective. Oh. You control Dr. Watson. To move in the game, just left click on the destination you want to reach. Double click will make him run. So. Oh, no, I can use Waz. Well, well. Holmes has received some French champagne with a card, a gift from a young admirer. Signed, Raoul Dandrecy. Who on earth could that be? Doesn't seem like it's any of my business, to be honest. Well, uh, first person certainly is novel. Um, no? Okay. Okay, C for casebook, so it's the same as before. Third person. Oh, now is when I, when I have to... Okay, I don't like that. I'd rather do first person. Um, it's more immersive anyway. Press R or middle mouse button to come back to third person mode. Remember, you can change it in time, so I can just do a bit like that. Okay, good. Press space button for a dynamic help to see all accessible items from your current position. Okay. Now time to start the game. Find a map on the table and click on it to take it into your inventory. Well, first, let's take a look around here, because I'm already seeing, uh, apparently, this was a callback. Uh, we did see these initials in darts. Um, in Sherlock's childhood room, so. The Queen's initials done in bullet holes. Good old Holmes. Okay, well, I guess that answers that. I didn't get it when I saw it in Sherlock Holmes Chapter 1, but okay. Um, I know these guys. <laughs> the Adventure of the Dancing Men. I remember it well. I recall when I was a child, I, I used to love to read. I, I've always been more into non-fiction than fiction. When I was a kid, I read my share of, um, you know, uh, young adult fantasy novels. And in one of those fantasy novels, it uh, talked briefly about um, ciphers. And that led to me reading books about cryptography. And I remember as a child, one of the ciphers that I learned was a simple substitution cipher using the dancing man symbols. Anyway. Holmes's experiment table. All right, that's neat. So we have a paper on the floor here, which is backwards. Why is it backwards? Uh, if I hit space from here, oh, there's the map. There's the door. What else we got? Violin here we can look at. Holmes's violin. He doesn't play nearly enough, if you ask me. Well, it says a lot when you can be friends with somebody who plays the violin and not end up hating the violin. So, if, uh, if we remember from chapter one, the violin has a story. It was given to him by the music teacher that we assisted. So. Um, this is the coal bucket in which Holmes keeps his cigars. What a funny idea. If you say so. This is how Holmes stores his post. Thank goodness his clients don't see this. And his pipes. It's a strange knife. Colonel Gordon, during the last adventure of the resident patient. Holmes uses this old Persian slipper to hold his pipe tobacco. Why? This is the harpoon that pierced the sailor Peter the Black. Bizarre little relic. I think it's more bizarre that it's so precariously perched on the gun rack. Seems like laying it flat down would be best. Um. Treaty on Cornish, the Celtic dialect of Cornwall. And here, medieval pottery. How can Holmes possibly read such things? What else should he be reading? Um, alright. Interesting, I suppose. Um, I can go through these doors. Let's see what's through here. 
Have you found the map of London, Watson? Come, my friend, it can't be too far. Be sure to locate the police station in Whitechapel we must get to. Understood, Holmes. All right, so that's Holmes's room. And this then... Watson's room? Yeah. Okay. And map. A map of London, at last. Let's see. The district of Whitechapel. Um, Whitechapel. I found the map, Holmes, and I was able to locate the Whitechapel police station. Congratulations, Watson. Come, the game is afoot. You can read the article to me on the way. We have arrived, Watson, in Whitechapel. Not very bright, and what cold. Brr, a typical London morning. Come, Watson, let's find this police station. You control Sherlock Holmes, okay. Then quickly, let's get to the police station. Honestly, the facial textures aren't too bad for 2009. The clothing is obviously pretty terrible. Building textures aren't bad. Looks pretty good to me. It's obviously not good by today's standards, but certainly playable. Well, this station isn't very well kept, I say. It's a local outpost, Watson. The daily tasks that confront these constables are not the easiest, and they are poorly paid. Hmm. Ring on the floor. Gentlemen, welcome. Hello. I would like to speak with the Chief Inspector, if you please. Constable Humphreys here. I am the only one in at the moment. Uh, what do you want with the Chief? My name is Sherlock Holmes. I am... Sherlock Holmes? The detective that I read about in the papers? Well, that's a treat, that is. You come about the Buck Road case, have you? Indeed. We... Not at all. Uh, we were just passing by chance. You say that there was a crime recently. You don't know. You must be the only folk in London who haven't heard. It won't be long until you find the culprit, no doubt. Nothing is less certain. Suspects, zero. Clues, zero. It's not good for us, especially not in this district. Okay, these are the things apparently I can ask about. Listen, this isn't what I came here for, but if I can be of service, in a confidential capacity, of course, if you can entrust me with a copy of the preliminary reports, I could study them and return <coughs> later with my conclusions. Hmm, it's just that these are official documents. I can't take a decision like that without the inspectors. The sooner we know the facts in the file, the sooner we can be of help, my friend. So, if you are Sherlock Holmes, you can find anything, isn't that true? With your magnifying glass, footprints? My performance is often embellished by my biographer. Oh, good. Good. I will give you the reports, but could you do me a small favour first? During my rounds, I dropped a leather folder containing some papers. Uh, nothing of importance, but it's a big mistake. I would go looking for it myself, but I am stuck here on duty. I must have lost it near the seedy boarding house not far from here. Left when you leave the courtyard and left again in the lane. Perhaps you could go ask around. Okay. Listen, nope. this oh, isn't what I came to. Hmm. The soon say my perf oh, during oh. I misclicked. This we one. shall see what we can do. Okay. Are we going to go look for these documents? Why not? It'll give us an occasion to take a tour of the district, Watson. Okay. Man said left and then left again. Oh, Alright. Is that Nona Ryder? Jeez. Sherlock's tall. He's taller than everybody. 
Jacob's Fisher umbrellas. Down this way. NPCs bumping into each other. Yeah, sweeping. You're doing a great job, buddy. You might want to think of a uh, step two after you get done sweeping because you have developed quite a pile. There's a cop right there. Pardon me, but can you give me some information? If it's to file a complaint, you should go to the station. Okay. I'm very robotic. Um, okay, I can't seem to do anything with that. Hey, stop walking. I'm standing in front of you. Wow. Get some oblivion vibes here. Um, okay. So, I guess it must be a little bit farther down. Then. Can I? Okay, good. I can at least run. I have my map. Um, does not have my current location on it. No. Go back. Here's the police station. He said left. And here's my first left. That was a dead end. So, the here. Right here. Commercial streets. Looking for a CD boarding house. No. CD boarding house. Gas without heat, smoke, or smell. Handy knife cleaner. Hmm. I have nothing to ask. Could ask about the boarding house. Okay. Mm I feel like we are in the right place because this is looking pretty seedy, but. Is that it? Doesn't look like a boarding house. St. Mary's Whitechapel Church. For Whitechapel Church, the clock is wrong. Whitechapel Street. Um, dispensary. The hospital is cross. Poultry. Bucks Row. Bucks Row. We'll be back here, I'm sure. I should we find this stupid fool there. Whitechapel Street. Whitechapel Street. Okay, how far do I need to go to do this? Um. There's the church, so I'm somewhere about. Here, this seems like the end of the line. I have no reason to go that way. Okay, so. Then there's only one more street to go on, and that's this one down here. It goes all the way to the end. So. Whoop, so. Bucks Road. Bucks Road, that's the only way to go. Police barriers. A gathering, Holmes, and policemen. Let's go see, perhaps. No, Watson. We have some business to take care of, and we are better off remaining discreet. <laughs> As a police officer bumps into me. Okay, so I have to. I, have to, I, I didn't. A gathering, Holmes, and, bumps and into policemen. Me again. Let's go see. No, Watson. Gotta find the stupid folder first. Okay, um, no 
down this way around the other side of the church. Is that where it is? Got a shilling, Gov. See the boarding house. Well, I guess maybe it's this. This building is a clinic. Okay, it's not. And that is... Okay, so... You can now mark the clinic. No, that's not... Whitechapel Street. Wow, okay. And, and I can't actually do it. Okay. Get the fuck out of the way, John. God, you're almost as annoying as the... Oh, there's John. Okay. Well, he did say take a left and then another left, and I didn't see a way that way, but I guess it must be. His old carriage designs. I never understand them. I don't know how one... Whatever, whatever the design process is. So I understood his these. Okay, doesn't seem to be. I'm just jamming on the space bar looking for things I can interact with at this point. Okay, <clears throat> um, notes, documents, dialogues. Not far from here, left when you leave the courtyard and left again in the lane. Come out of the courtyard, take a left, take another left. That seems to be where we are. Police station. Commercial Street. Burner Street. Commercial Street. Daddy Street. Commercial Street. Horse's ass. What's this? Closed. Okay, I don't know what that is. I have no reason to go that way. Okay. Wow, this is going to be a long game if I can't even find the boarding house. Burner. If I find the boarding house over here, I'm going to be furious because that cop's directions were completely wrong. I, 
this point I would like to find it regardless, but I would certainly be angry if I found it over here. <clears throat> Okay, um... Commercial streets, end of the line. I have no reason to go that way. I do. The reason is I'm giving up and I'm going home. Take a left. I hear somebody screaming, and nobody is concerned. Oh, good God. Good day, sir. You wouldn't happen to have seen a leather folder on the ground. How in the name of God was I Good supposed day, to know? Gentlemen, Finley, caretaker of this building, here to serve. And yes, less than an hour ago. But some of the local urchins picked it up, and God only knows where it might be now. That's unfortunate. This police bag contained documents that the local police will miss. Your inspectors? Not at all. I am Dr. Watson. And this is Sherlock Holmes, the detective. Sherlock Holmes, the great detective. You must be here about last night's murder. Have you discovered the identity of the poor woman? Indeed, I'd only to read the papers. Mine is dated from this morning, and it does not say who it is. I'm not really engaged in this case, but if I can help the police, I will do so willingly. Oh, to be sure. I've been told that Inspector Aberline is in charge. A very capable man. Uh, indeed, that is the name of the inspector who was in charge of the Jack the Ripper Kings. So, according to you, I have no chance of finding this folder, then? Indeed. But I, on the other hand, should be able to find it. Do me a favour in exchange. A vagrant comes almost every night to sleep in one of the nooks not far from my windows. He coughs, howls, sometimes even sings. He's quite hefty and I don't dare approach him. I've lost three tenants because of him. If it's you who speaks to the police, they will take this matter more seriously. Tell them about the captain. They'll know who you're talking about. In the meantime, I'll find your police bag. Okay. Um, another Whitechapel mystery, horrible murder in Bucks Row, Whitechapel. Scarcely has the order and sensation caused by the discovery of the murdered woman in Whitechapel some short time ago. Had discovery is made. Really exercise victims even more shocking. Will no doubt create a great sensation. Okay. Um, between 35 and 40 years of age, lying at the side of the street with her throat cut right open ear from ear. The instrument with which the deed was done, traversing the throat from left to right. The wound was about two inches wide and blood was flowing profusely. She was discovered to be lying in a pool of blood. She was immediately conveyed to the Whitechapel mortuary where it was found that besides the wound in the throat, the lower part of the abdomen was completely ripped open with the bowels protruding. The wound extends nearly to the breast and must have been affected with a large knife. That's another very long documents. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I read the first one and it hasn't seemed to be so far helpful, but maybe I'll come back to it if I run short on clues. Let's go to the police station. I'm very frustrated by that. There's all these people on the streets and all of them. Oh, I suppose that I didn't notice before. When I press space, the speech bubble doesn't show up for them, but it does show up for John, and it did show up for that guy. Alright, so maybe that was just me. I'm still getting used to the mechanics, I guess. Now I'll know that if I see a speech bubble, then it's important to talk to them. So, gentlemen, have you found my police bag? Not quite yet. Do you know a vagrant who goes by the name of the Captain? Captain? Yes, an old sailor, strong as a Turk and tattooed from head to toe. The drink has turned him into a derelict. He appears to be causing some problems for the caretaker of the building at the end of the street. What do you want us to do? 
Every night, stairwells, halls and porches become public dormitories, and people don't only come to sleep. I believe this man has a niece who puts him up sometimes. Her lodgings are in Commercial Street, right after the alley with the boarding house. You won't forget my folder, will you? Do you believe this woman will agree to have her uncle stay with her? No idea. Oh well, let's go see her just the same. Um, so not to impugn in any fashion any of the voice actors, but technically speaking, I've noticed that Sherlock Holmes' voiceover lines are they're not there. very... This is where the niece of the captain must live. Not very clean. Um, there's a lot of popping and hissing and a bit muffled and it's almost like it was recorded with the... Uh, well, it doesn't sound very good. Good day, but it's not Would the you voiceover actor. It's the man more known of a technical as the captain. Than I oh, do. yes, that would be me. What has he done this time? He isn't. Oh my god, I'm on my way. Oh. Miss, we have come to ask if you could have your uncle come live with you. He sleeps under the windows of a boarding house, causes the caretaker no end of problems. I know. I I've lodged him for a while, and he was the same here. My landlord made me kick him out. I'm ashamed, you know. I never should have given the state of his health. It coughs day and night. There might be a way to calm his cough. I am a doctor. I could examine him. He went to see a doctor at the clinic. But the medicine costs too much. I can hardly pay my win. We will see to it. Where might your uncle be found? I don't know. He must be in the vicinity, but I don't know exactly where. We will find him. Holmes, this is serious. Find an alcoholic in Whitechapel? A needle in a haystack would be easier. Come, dear doctor, let's trust to our lucky star. Moreover, we also have our informers, remember? Are you referring to those brats to whom you are always giving charity? Exactly. My secret police. Some of them are surely roam in this area. It suffices to find them. Regulars. Um, this seems to be who the camera settled on. Hello, young man. How are you? I recognize him. It's the lad who sells newspapers, who is always calling outside our windows at Baker Street, early in the morning. Hello, Mr. Holmes. It's a treat to see you again. What can I do? Would you happen to know an old sailor who goes by the name of the captain? A poor man who hits the bottle a bit hard. Of course, Mr. Holmes. He's there at the end of the street. Round to the left he is. But be careful. He can be a tough customer, that one. Very good, my young man. The doctor will give you a little something. Watson? Huh? I say, Holmes. Is he always such a skinflint with you, Mr. Holmes? Well, thanks to you, Mr. Holmes. Anytime you need me. At the end of the street, to uh, assume he needs this street. You alright? Hmm. I have nothing to ask. Well, I wasn't asking you to ask. It looks like he's had his shit beat now that he's begging for money. I can hear someone coughing more than his natural homes. Yes, Watson. The poor man cannot be too far away. Yeah, like how in Victorian London, with all this smog, the doctor considers a certain amount of coughing to be natural. Um. Oh, there he is. If, in order to listen to us, this man imposes as condition that we find his pet cockroach, uh, there will be another murder in Whitechapel today, Watson. Yours. Ha ha. <laughs> he is in a critical state, Holmes. He has barely a month left. Is there a way, dear doctor, to ensure that this last month passes in silence? Really, Holmes, sometimes you... Oh, really? I will make note of some medicine to get immediately that will relieve his pain. Very well. I will locate an apothecary or a clinic. Okay, well, I know where that is because we passed it before, so... Okay, I can fast travel. Hooray! Yeah, 
after dark. Good day, sir. Dr. Gibbons, you aren't from around these parts. Indeed, Doctor. It is for someone from your neighbourhood that I am here, though. His doctor asked that I acquire some medicine on his behalf. I have the note here. Dr. Watson? Not from round here, neither. This medication is quite dear. Certain documents are necessary to obtain them for free. I don't have it. You'll have to accept my spare change. Will it be enough? Enough to relieve your patient for a month. Would you like me to make this prescription available after that time? According to Dr. Watson, that won't be necessary. The possibility of a recovery? A definitive one, yes. There, sir. Thank you. It's rather quiet here. An unusual chain of events. The majority of the people hereabouts went out last night to see the great fire at the warehouse. The patients that I was minding and my staff were no exception. The former were dramatically healed and the latter ended up sick. And with the murder last night, most of the people who weren't working wandered over to the scene of the crime. Their little aches and pains will wait until tonight or tomorrow. A squalid murder, it would seem. Just like what this area has become. My See thanks, ya. Doctor. Not at all. Find the medicine homes, we must make haste. I did. Find the medicine homes, we must make haste. I did. Find the medicine homes, we must make haste. I did. Am I supposed to... I'm supposed to do that. What's to do with it? Find the medicine homes. We must make haste. What the hell? What do I do with it? Find the medicine homes. We must make haste. I can choose items this way. Here is the medication, Watson. Is our man movable? He should be able to stand in a few minutes and will no longer be suffering from his cough before long. Consider the affair resolved. Accompany him to his nieces while I return to the boarding house and then join me at the police station. Mm -hmm. Let's return to the boarding house. On my bag, buddy. I have good news for you, Mr. Finley. We have sent a captain to stay with a relative, and he shouldn't bother you for a while. I also have some good news. I have your police bag. Thank you. I bid you good day. Oh, it was nothing. Tell me, one of my wife's friends lost... Another day, Finley. Another day. Let's go to the police station. So, what news do you have, Mr. Holmes? Are you sure it's the police bag that you lost? Yes, but someone attempted to force it open. They didn't succeed, but now the lock is stuck. Perhaps you could... Hmm, let's see. Um, okay. What am I supposed to put them in order? Like, okay, I think I am. I think I'm supposed to put them in order, like one, two, three, four, five, six thing. You know, though exactly why I think the order is one, two, three, four, five, six, and not one, two, three, four, five, six is entirely just because I feel like. Um, that is a logical, not quite, hold on, uh, four, five, 
Okay, so four. Move six over here. Two. Four. I gotta move five. Over here. Uh, I'm gonna have to take three for a ride though. And then five's got to come around to there. Oh, nope, I got a reverse one. Five. Ah, uh, a big thank you, Mr. Holmes. Think nothing of it, my friend. So, the reports. Why don't you wait till the inspectors get back? You would certainly learn more. If I wanted to meet the inspectors, I would have done so. So, give me the preliminary reports, and above all, do not mention my visit to anyone. Is that clear? Sure, if that's what you want. Here are the reports. Thank you. All right, preliminary reports. At least it's not three pages long. Henry Llewellyn, surgeon. Her throat had been cut from left to right. Two distinct cuts being on the left side, the windpipe, gullet, and spinal cord being cut through. A bruise apparently of a thumb being on the right lower jaw, also one of the left cheek. The abdomen had been cut open from the center of the bottom of the ribs along the right side, under the pelvis, to the left of the stomach. There, the wound was jagged. The omentum, or coating, of the stomach was also cut in several places. Two small stabs on private parts, apparently done with a strong bladed knife. Supposed to have been done by some left-handed person, death being almost instantaneous. Have you obtained the preliminary reports? Yes, we'll read them on the go. Let's to the scene of the crime at Bucks Row, Watson. Okay. But what are all these people doing here, Holmes? Apparently they came to see the scene of the crime. What about us? Aren't we going to see it? We will return this evening, Watson. The circumstances should be ideal for carrying out our little experiments. Well, Watson, we are at the scene of the Polly Nichols murder. Imagine the victim lying at the spot where she was found and try to discern all of the clues we can. Watson, you are a writer. I am therefore entrusting you with our deduction board. It will help us to establish certain facts. Understood, Holmes. Okay. It's a very detailed chalk outline. Um, chalk outlines aren't really a thing, but that's fine. Why did it? Oh, am I supposed to like manually? No marks on the ground. No footsteps on the ground. Okay. The ground is muddy. Let's look at this poor woman more closely. All right. Um, am I supposed to use this? What? The throat was slit from left to right. There are two incisions. There is a bruise on the left cheek. There is a bruise at the level of the right maxilla. All right, well, that was all in the report. Clothing torn. We don't care about that. A small pool of blood, six inches in diameter. A small pool of blood, six inches in diameter. The throat was slit from left to right. There are two incisions. The throat was slit from left to right. There are two incisions. The tongue is swollen. OK. 
can't tell if I got everything or... The body was lying on its back, legs straight and slightly apart. The skirt had been lifted up to the middle of the body. The left hand was touching the barn door. The body was still warm. Let's reread the preliminary report for the details on the wounds inflicted upon this poor woman. There is a black bonnet near the left hand. All right, it looks like when I have discovered the clue, the, so the uh, magnifying glass turns green, and when I haven't, it's clear. No so. signs of blood. So I can look around and at least see if it's something I've spotted before. John, was it you? What are we doing, Holmes? Was it you, John? I think I got everything. How do I check out the deduction board again? Map, documents, dialogues, open, close, inventory. Doesn't say so. Deduction. Okay. No footsteps on the ground. Dumped, the murderer warned the victim up. The victim wasn't dragged. Um, that's not enough blood for her to die from it, so tongue is bloated. Looks like a fright. Um, the bruise was caused by hard pressure with the fingers. The murderer gagged the victim by gripping tightly. Um, well, these two aren't mutually, mutually exclusive. The bruise is caused by hard pressure from the fingers because he was gagging the victim by gripping tightly. Uh, I mean... It happened fast, but yeah. Um, the victim was... Um, the lack of blood, then, I guess, would be because she was already dead. So all of the cut wounds would be post-mortem. So. Um, so the green, does that mean it's correct? And if it's red, it's not? Okay. Um, anything else? Okay. What's with the orange? What does the orange and the not orange mean? Um, inventory help. Oh. Oh, there's two two boards here. So we'll trace of wooden walls. Okay. The victim had her throat slit, no traces of blood on the walls. Uh, the victim did not have her throat slit while standing. A little pool of blood, the murderer wanted the uh, blood spurt. Blood didn't flow in strong spurts because she was already dead. Dirty and damp ground, he could not have had relations on the ground. The murderer threw water on the ground. There were relations on the ground. Um... Uh, okay. Um, dead before being stretched out and having her throat slit. Okay. And then this Polly Nichols. Is that it? I don't know what to do now. What do I do now? Okay, um, 
There is only one street light lit on this street, Watson, and this spot is particularly poorly lit. This spot is deserted, Holmes. The prostitutes only come here to exercise. Well, Watson, we have found all of the possible clues, I think. Uh, we will now attempt to recreate the scene of the murder. Come closer, Watson. I have to make you up. <coughs> what? You are joking, Holmes. I feel ridiculous, Holmes. Now, Watson, come and stand here in front of me. You shall play the role of the poor woman and I shall play that of the murderer. Let's try to reconstruct the facts to ensure the final result corresponds indisputably to the way that Polly Nichols was killed. Standing up or laying position. Bare hands, knife. Left hand, right hand, well we know he was left handed. Neck, stomach, Jack's position. Um, yep, like that. Left handed according to the report, knife. Um that seems to be it. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck, and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. Oh, I can move around. All right, good. Um, I mean, okay. Murder must have been sitting on the victim. Knife in the left hand or right. The streets. The victim was holding her bonnet in her hand at the time of the murder. This bonnet was already on the ground. I mean, she was holding her bonnet. It would have been in her hand if it was there when the body was set down. Uh, the victim was asking for alms. The victim wasn't afraid. The victim collected the bonnet from the ground. I mean, she didn't seem to be afraid. She trusted them. Or at least trusted them enough. She wasn't cautious. She didn't have the bonnet. Had her bonnet in her hand and was ready to exercise. Weird terminology, but okay. So that, that's it. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Um. The murderer had enough room to inflict the wounds to the neck, and these wounds suggest the left hand was used. Um. supposed to do um standing up i mean this is where it would have started right and that's a thumbprint on the other side this position is unlikely uh, yeah it's the other hand Yes, it's quite possible the events occurred like this. My dear Watson, now that we have found all of our clues, nothing remains but to subject them to our most likely hypotheses in order to deduce the facts. Okay. Killer's right hand prevented the victim from screaming. There were relations while standing up. The killer's left hand prevented the victim from screaming. Uh, 
Um, can I strangle the victim with his right hand? Killer's not left hand. Um, is... Did I get those backwards? Did I get those backwards? Um, I'm pretty sure from the reenactment we saw that was the left hand. And then, obviously, if he was silencing her with his left hand, he had to use his right hand. We know he used the knife in his left hand, which indicates that he's left-handed, but... To use a non-dominant hand to actually strangle somebody means they might be ambidextrous. Is that it? These are still red, though. Okay. The victim was most probably dead before being laid down. Once the heart <clears> stopped, <throat> gravity drained the body slowly, not in a heavy spurt that would have stained half the street. Thank you, Holmes. I understand why you told me not to change clothes. Do you realize that our behavior didn't alarm anyone? The victim's ordeal was even more discreet. By acting in silence, we have confirmed something. The crime definitely took place here. The victim and her murderer were able to come here without making any noise, and afterwards the murder took place without the slightest cry being uttered. Come, Watson, let's go home. We have spent far too long in this sinister alley. <sighs> and so, my dear Watson, the day and night which we passed in Whitechapel were enlightening, weren't they? An adventure that I most certainly will never relate, to be in the skin of that poor woman. I prefer not to speak of it further. But have we really learned anything about the murderer? Obviously a man, given the necessary strength. We have little to go on, at least no more than the police. But in my opinion, Inspector Abilene has a trick or two up his sleeve. No, I want to talk about the facts and what we can draw from them. We know where the crime was committed and under what conditions. I would like to ask you about the possible motives for the crime. According to you, Watson, what could have pushed the murderer to act in such a way? Okay, <clears throat> well, of course these days we can look back on the crime and with modern investigative techniques we can ascribe certain most likely um, behavioral and personality traits to the offender, which again, if you haven't seen the profile done by John Douglas, I recommend, but Jack the Ripper um, targeted vulnerable victims and uh, really would these days be typified as a disorganized killer. I mean, more or less, he has a preference for victim types, but largely uh, is uh, more of a, a predator of targets of opportunity than anything else. And uh, because of his selection of these vulnerable women, you know, well, anyway, I'm not going to speculate on this case, but um, th these days he would be... Um, anyway, victim suffered horrible mutilations, which indicates that the offender had a personal grudge and wanted to destroy or humiliate victims. Um, credible motive, even if it's a field that Sherlock doesn't know, let me guess this is supposed to be a dig at Sherlock regarding his love life. The victim was an occasional prostitute without family or ties, so... Mm, resentment can lead to irreparable acts guessing madness then victim lived in misery so maybe that motivated Theft, him to perhaps. feel 
I have a hard time believing that someone would attack poor Polly so fiercely just to rob her of a few coins. Um, or implying that she's a witch or something? Um, no, no. Okay, so I'm, am I might have picked just one, or what, what, what am I? What is my point here? Um, I mean, indications due just to the injuries. Although we know that this is very unlikely. <clears throat> it says that love is a credible motive, but not for, not for a crime like this. It seems pretty random, but I don't know if I'm supposed to pick. I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. Um, I mean, I can pick all of them. Nothing is happening. Um, this doesn't seem likely. I, I guess we can't rule out just plain madness. I don't think black magic. I don't see why we would think that. Just the nature of the crime seems this is unlikely. What am I supposed to do now? Well, we are still missing certain information in order to finish this investigation, Watson. So, what are we doing, Holmes? Where am I supposed to go and get that information? Can I go in my room now? I can. Sherlock's room. Is that a bust of Mycroft? Okay. Am I just supposed to randomly choose? Okay, um... Revenge, Holmes? Revenge could be a possible motive, but with one small reservation, okay. we have reason to believe that the victim considered her murderer to be a typical client. Okay, so when I get a text dialogue, that's my indication that I've chosen correctly. Mm. Theft, perhaps. I have a hard time believing that someone would attack poor Polly so fiercely just Which to means I got her all of them wrong cons. except for that one on my first try. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um. Homicidal insanity, Holmes. Seems like it a is game of trial and error there. The man there. who did this to Polly Nichols is not of his full senses. And it wasn't this one last time, Black so. magic? I'm not terribly interested in the occult or black magic. Let's give the benefit of the doubt to this motive. A personal drama. Love can certainly lead to many a drama, but we have to consider the fact that the victim didn't know her attacker. Yeah, okay. I mean, it seemed like my reasoning before was just fine. But from the dialogues, it sounds like we're discounting... It sounds like we're including this just because Sherlock doesn't know a lot about it, which doesn't make any sense. Um, it seems like the response to this one was positive. These two are definitely elementary. Negative. Okay. Very well, Watson. I think that we've exhausted the topic. Take a rest, and we'll speak again later. Ah, it would seem that the investigation is advancing, Holmes. Yesterday's star said that a suspect is in the hands of the police. A man with a rather sinister reputation. I was about to join you in your optimistic outlook until you informed me that the good news came from the press, Watson. But surely they wouldn't invent the fact that the police are holding a suspect or the acts that are attributed to him. You will have an exact answer to these two questions in less than 50 seconds, Watson. Pardon? Enter, Inspector. Good day. Dear Watson, allow me to introduce Inspector Abeline. Inspector, Dr. Watson. Inspector? To what do we owe the honorable presence, Inspector? 
I heard that the two of you made your way to Whitechapel a few days ago. Your arrival, you are aware, coincides with a very serious affair which our police service is going to great lengths to solve and which is creating strong tensions in the area. Pardon me, but haven't you arrested someone? A certain leather apron? Absolutely not. The man who hides behind this name is indeed being actively searched for by the force. Besides, nothing at the moment suggests that he is the Bucks Row murderer. There, you've been enlightened, Watson. Now it is our turn to answer Inspector Aberline's questions. Indeed. I will be brief and precise. Do you intend to investigate this case, or have you already started? It is to be of service to a friend that I went to Whitechapel. We did, out of curiosity, familiarize ourselves with the preliminary reports, and we made our way to the scene of the crime. Our conclusions are slim, as are the clues. Having not been officially appointed by a client, I believe that my intervention in this business will end there. Very well. To be frank, you take the weight off my shoulders by distancing yourself from the case. Our image isn't very good, to say nothing of what the press puts us through. Thus, if overnight they found out that you were on the case, people would turn against us. And they would pest me, overwhelm me, and finally make me out to be responsible for the inevitable failure such a scenario entails. <coughs> Neither you nor I wish for this to happen. I know that your time is precious, Inspector. I will send you a note regarding my conclusions shortly. With pleasure. Gentlemen? Do you think that he will find the murderer? The chances are slim to non-existent. It is seven days now, short of a confession from the murderer himself. And you will not go further? You heard the Inspector Watson. My presence in Whitechapel would hinder, which doesn't mean that we will drop the case. How is that? The Inspector spoke of me, but not of us. It is you, Watson, who will lead the investigation tonight. It is you who will bring to the police station the little note that I will write regarding our conclusions. Despite the late hour, there is nothing to stop you from making inquiries about this famous leather apron while you are there. Okay. Another tremendously long bit of text. Okay. So we go to the police station and we hand in the note. Well, if I follow Holmes's instructions, then to begin my investigation into this leather apron, I must first head to the police station. All right, I'm trying to stick it out for the first, you know, investigation of this game, but to be honest with you, I am intensely bored and the mechanics are quite frustrating. So I don't know if Good we're evening, keep doing sir. This one. What do you I know you. You were here last week with Sherlock Holmes. Well, goodbye. Oh, and shit like that is exactly what I'm talking about. Some news, Doctor? Indeed. I have come to bring a message from Sherlock Holmes for Inspector Aberline. Very well, I will pass it on. But come to think of it, someone was asking about you recently. Fiddly, the caretaker of some shady boarding house nearby. Does that mean anything to you? Ah, perhaps. Actually, I read in the Star that you have arrested a suspect called Leather Apron. You shouldn't believe what you read in that rag, sir. The man is being hunted, but we have yet to get our hands on him, and we aren't close to it either. Why ever not? Bah, he's a specialist in the streetwalker racket. These girls make pitiful witnesses, and we don't inspire confidence. Furthermore, the man seems to be pretty discreet lately. Someone must be helping to hide him. How to get on his trail, then? One of these girls would have to confide in us and give a valid description of the man. Then we'd ask around the journeymen, who use aprons, I imagine. Well, goodbye. I must go to Finley's boarding house. Stopped sweeping and started doing something else, but still making sweeping noises, my dear. Good evening, Finlay. Oh, good evening, sir. Aren't you the gentleman who was with the great detective the other time? That is indeed me, Dr. Watson. Tell me, Finlay, I was told that you were looking for us at the police station. Indeed, I wanted to thank you for last time, you know. That vagrant has never set foot round mine again. 
I even found a tenant, one who pays his rent, I mean. You don't seem very happy, but you were lucky to have found a good tenant so quickly. It's just that this man is very strange. He paid several days in advance and I gave him a key to the place. Since then he goes out every night and returns at ungodly hours. I'm sure he goes to visit the ladies, but still, every night. And when he moved in, something must have broken in his case and stank up the stairs in his room for two days. I think it was a jar. It must be over there. Tell me, have you heard talk of Leather Apron? By the papers, that's all. This man seems very sinister. Do you know any journeymen who use this type of apron? The slaughterhouse butchers, I believe, but definitely the cobblers. I know one, old Isaac Solomonovich. His workshop is on a small street in the Jewish community, across from the hospital. He's a good man. He can help you. But you know, the people there are very close and don't share much with non-Jews. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. Okay. Let's see what this jar is about. Hmm. This odour is very strong indeed, but the whole neighbourhood as such has a dreadful stench. Finley might have an idea as to what this jar had contained. What do you want, Doctor? You're right. The pieces of the jar that your tenant broke do give off a strange smell. It's true. That's quite normal given his trade. Yes, and what would the trade be of your strange tenant? A doctor, like yourself, I believe. Dr. Tumbletee, a foreigner. Canadian, perhaps. Dr. Tumbletee. It might be interesting to know more about him. Thank you, Finley. At your service, sir. All right. There were a lot of theories of who Jack the Ripper actually was. Leather Apron was actually a, a suspect in the case. Um, but uh, it was also reported that uh, so precise were the incisions in the bodies that they must have had some training either as a butcher or a doctor. Um, now I'm looking for... What's his name? So much text. Alright, so where am I going to find... What was his name? Isaac. A cobbler shop. Hmm. Closed. I will return later. The policeman said the street girls would know something about the leather apron. Maybe I should go and see Lucy. Okay. She just oh, day it's and night you. stands in front I'm of the open window. Doctor Watson, how are you? How's your uncle doing? Well, and yourself? And how's your uncle? Well, he sleeps a lot, but he doesn't seem to be suffering. Your medicine has worked wonders. Thank you again. It was the least I could do. I have come to see you about a certain leather apron. Have you heard of him? Oh, yes, of course. Terrible things are said about that man. Have you ever come across him? Goodness gracious, no. But I know that he has threatened and taken many girls in uh, my situation. I don't know what more I can say, but um, Bella would be able to tell you some. Who's that? Who is Bella? Bella Pullman. She's the landlady of the place where I... Uh, I could take you there if you like. Please do. It's me. It's Lucy. John, please This gentleman do. would like to speak to Bella. It's the doctor who helped me. I must leave to return to my uncle. 
Thanks again. Am I supposed to go in here? Hey. Out of the way, I don't like the look of you. <laughs> Out of the way, I don't like the look of you. A vague Kermit the Frog sort of thing going on there. Alright. Nice place. Can I get a refill, If you'd be patient, Madame Bella will arrive in a moment. Good evening. I am Dr. Watson. It is young Lucy who told me to come see you. Ah, so you're the good Samaritan who saved her uncle without asking for anything in return. And now you've come to see me, no doubt, to explain that the poor little thing doesn't belong here and you will see to her future. Well, if you expect me to let her leave with you. <laughs> it's not that, ma'am. Uh, you should know I am a married man. And why should that matter? I just need some information. I believe there has been a misunderstanding. The reason that Lucy sent me here is that you may be able to give me some information about Leather Apron. Are you a doctor or a constable? I am most certainly a doctor, but I am acting in this matter in a private capacity, and I would like to find this man. Well, if you're able to rid us of him, I'll give you a week's worth of free passes. That man is a thorn in our sides. He spies on the girls in the streets and watches them inside the houses, spying through the windows. And as soon as they're finished with a client, he jumps on them without any warning and forces them to give him their money. I've never seen him, but one of my girls was attacked by this man and she said that he wore a leather apron and carried a knife. And his face, oh, he has a horrible head with rat's eyes and a deformed mouth. She even said that she knew his name, um, Pizer or Pizer, I think. But I don't know where she can be found. Margie Nutcracker, the girl I'm talking about, could tell you more, but I had to let her go last week. Why? Why did you let Margie go? The poor girl caught a shameful sickness and the symptoms have attacked her face, if you know what I mean. So I gave her notice and a little bit to help her along. I don't know where she is now, but she'll certainly be getting treatment at the clinic if she's still in the neighbourhood. Did you speak to the police? <sighs> what would they do? Who cares about the girls in the streets? Alright, there's a doctor that's apparently been coming here every night. Would you have received a visit from another doctor? A stranger by the name of Tumbletit? I'm just like you, Doctor. Sworn to secrecy in my profession. But as I've taken a fancy to you, I can tell you that this name is not unknown to me. And if you do me a little favour, it is possible I might remember something about it. What do you want now? <clears throat> uh, what kind of favour must I do for you? You see that man over there? He's a rich artist, a painter, a regular client round here. He looks like he's well, fucking yesterday, 11. yesterday, he came and left his cane in the umbrella stand in the hall before going into one of the rooms. Well, when he returned to this room, the cane had disappeared. It's a cane with a massive silver knob. It must be worth a fortune. He is he a silver knob. He threatened to call the police unless he got free services in my establishment for a year. I'll be forced to accept, unwillingly, of course, given the services that he's demanding, unless the cane is found. Okay, what happened? Did you question the residents regarding the theft? They didn't see anything, and there's not one of them that would risk stealing from a client here. Who was in the room when your weasel of a client was in the chambers? There were a few that came and went, but Mary could tell you better than I can, because she was the one at the counter yesterday. Thank you, ma'am. No problem, my angel. <laughs> what happened to this rug? Oh, it's when we got a coal yesterday. I asked the young man to fill the pail. He came back to put it down, but his feet were covered in soot and he made a black print. Madame Bella said it was my fault and I got a shilling's penalty. I also have to clean the print and it's no picnic. He has immense feet, that boy. I heard that there was a theft yesterday. Did you see anything? No, and I was here the whole time. 
Who delivers the coal? It's never the same person. I've never seen that lad before. Do you always keep an eye on the coat stand? Oh, yes. Well, when the coal delivery came, a client came out of the chambers and stopped me from seeing the boy who brought the bucket of coal. You don't think he would have taken advantage? Until next time, miss. With pleasure, sir. A large black footprint. Best not to stray off in that direction. Looks like he's about 11 years old. What the hell? Good evening, sir. Good evening, my dear man. I was led to believe that you're a doctor. None of the residents of this establishment are among my patients, sir. Oh, you're not here as a doctor, but as a man, then. I understand. This is my kind of place, too. It's in these houses in Whitechapel that you find the girls that are the most natural and definitely the most docile. Your way of speaking about these women is not that of a gentleman, sir. Tell me about your large silver knob. I heard that you were the victim of a robbery here. Oh, I'm not complaining. The loss of that walking stick will certainly bring me a very pleasant compensation. You know, could also have been given pleasant compensation by selling the cane then, if you're really not What so does your hard cane look it. like? The stick is ebony, about 35 inches long. The round knob is made from chiseled silver with a ring around the middle of the same workmanship, just like the tip for that matter. If you find it, don't tell a soul. Keep it for yourself, got it? Well, goodbye. Okay. Goodbye. Or until next time. And good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Best not to stray off in that direction. Best not to stray off in that direction. Back here with. Okay. Um. Suppose we go talk to Large Marge, huh? I understand you have some sort of flesh eating bacteria. No, not her. stuck on invisible things. These That's... footprints are the same as those found on the rug at the brothel. Okay. Okay, I can only talk to the doctor, okay then? Good evening, doctor. My name is Dr. Watson. Pleased to meet you. Good evening. I am Dr. Gibbons. Likewise. Um, there was a woman here with no face. I have no come face. to see you about one of your patients. Margie uh, goes by the nickname Nutcracker, who gets her prescription from the clinic. She's a lady of the night and is afflicted with a venereal disease. I know who you're talking about. Indeed, Margie has syphilis and is being treated with mercury. Do you have her address? No. And for your information, she left London for good three days ago. She felt threatened. Margie felt threatened? But by whom? I believe that Margie was particularly scared of a terrifying man who attacked her once. Did she say the name Pizer or Pytha? Unfortunately, she didn't give a name, but she described a man with shifty, rat-like eyes and a mouth twisted in a sinister grimace. Did Margie have any idea where this man who terrified her so much might be found? No, but she told me that another girl who'd been attacked like her had told her that this man worked in a cobbler's run by an old Israeli. Also, she saw him again last week the night of the big fire. She told of going to see the fire like most everyone else in the area. While there, she recognised her attacker in the crowds gathered at the warehouses. There was no mistake in a face like that, she said. She kept an eye on the man the whole time the firemen were working in order to avoid him. 
Pardon me, Doctor, but who made the large black footprints there near the beds? The brother of one of my patients. The poor thing had a leg amputated after colliding with a carriage. We arranged to find her a prosthesis. Prostheses are very expensive. How did this man pay? He told me that one of his uncles gave him a walking stick with a chiselled silver knob. I agreed to accept this knob in exchange for a simple prosthesis oh, with harness. But this go. object is of great value and I could finance half a dozen other prostheses by selling it on Petticoat Lane. Doctor, I have reason to believe that the silver knob that you possess is from a cane that was stolen by the man who brought it to you. And I believe I know to whom it belongs. That's what I was worried about. The story of the uncle seemed a little strange. Nevertheless, you must have proof of what you claim. I will show you all of the knobs that we have here. If you find the knob that the young man gave me, I will believe you. OK. So be it. But something is bothering me. I will need a complete cane, not just a knob. Don't worry, dear chap. Build one. I can loan you some tools. Make use of the odds and ends in my cupboard. It'll help get rid of it. Hmm. Well, I shall try. I will have to remember the description that Sickert gave. OK. Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Until we meet again, my dear colleague. Okay, uh, well, we know that the shaft was ebony, 35 inches long. Um, this is not marked in inches, so what the fuck? Okay, fine. Uh, chiseled silver. Um, this. And it had a ring about it, he said, of the same. And then he said that the bottom also. So that. There, all done. Holmes couldn't have done better himself. All right, then. What can I do for you, my dear colleague? I believe I found the knob from the stolen cane, which I succeeded in putting back together. That's the one. And yet I cannot give it to you, Doctor. I will only return it to the police, and only if there is an official complaint against me. Would there be a way to convince you to give me the cane? Find me a dozen solid, adjustable harnesses for wooden leg prostheses, and it's yours, Doctor. How the fuck am I supposed to find that? Goodbye, Dr Gibbons. Uh, Until we meet again, my dear colleague. I'll just go contact my medical equipment wholesaler. What the fuck, Doctor? It's stolen, I suppose. This interview with the doctor revealed an important fact. Leather Apron could not be the Bucks Row murderer. According to Margie, the villain passed most of the night of the crime at the fire. He could not have been at the scene of the murder at the moment it was committed. He is nonetheless a dangerous character. Okay. He was working for the cobbler, he said as well. Or, well, he put it slightly differently, but that's what I took it as. Does that mean I can go in here now? There's nobody here. How very odd. Apparently I can. Okay. I say, these things look like harnesses. Oh my, they are noisy. Good evening, sir. Pardon the interruption. The door was open. I didn't think that I would find anyone working at this hour. Good evening, sir. I didn't hear you come in. Say, those things that made noise, they are really harnesses, aren't they? Yes, horse harnesses. But I must tell you, sir, that the store is normally closed at this hour. That is why I've asked you to return tomorrow. I didn't come about my shoes. I came to speak of a cobbler, perhaps one of your former employees, a man with very particular habits. You aren't with the police by any chance. I'm sorry, but I do not want to speak of anything but shoes with you. 
I am not a policeman. I am Dr. Watson. It's Mr. Finley who told me that you might be in a position to inform me. Ah, that Mr. Finley is a very brave man. And if he sent you, then you must certainly be a worthy man also. So, Doctor, who is this cobbler with strange habits? The man of whom I speak is called Pizer or Pyther, a man with a frightening face. Do you know him? Yes, John Pizer. He worked here for a while, but he is no longer here. Do you know where I can find him? No, and if you look, you will not find him. Why? Because he is in hiding, Doctor. You see, a week ago, a horrible murder took place in the neighborhood. A rumor circulated that he might have been responsible for this crime. They say he has quarreled with women of certain virtue in the past, if you understand me. Isaac, it is about the Bucks Road case that I have come to see you. I have the certitude and an incontestable witness that Pizer is innocent, at least of this crime, although he has attacked a number of street women. If he doesn't come forward to explain himself to the authorities, he is condemned to hiding and to take the fall for this murder. Furthermore, it will cast suspicions on your community because they must be hiding him. And while the whole police force is hunting for him, they cannot concentrate on the real assassin who roams the streets and, one never knows, may take any one of you any day. If what you say is true, your visit is a godsend to our community, Doctor. I tell you something. I know Sergeant Thick, an honest policeman who lives in the area. I'll tell John's family that he must go there to explain himself. But if you could please go as soon as possible to the police to give them this report that you say is incontestable. I will go as soon as I take leave of you. Thank you. If I can ever be of service in any way, do not hesitate to ask. Could we transform your horse harnesses into harnesses for wooden legs? Adjustable harnesses? A good craftsman can do anything, Doctor. And I do believe that's what I am. Come back in a while and it will be done. That will be my thanks for what you have done. I shall return later. At your convenience, sir. Okay. Ah, I am spent. I would like to return home. But I promised to go to the police as soon as I could. Now then, let's go to the police station. Cat's meat. Will you? Yes. Hey, Doctor, you seem tired. Were you wandering the darker parts of Whitechapel all night? You could say that. I have some information on Leather Apron, the man of whom we spoke earlier. Do you know where he is? No, but I can clear him of the Bucks Row crime. A witness proved him totally innocent. Oh, Watson, Watson, is it only now, after many hours of walking, that you decide to pass on the important message that Inspector Abiline is waiting for? But, um, no. But what are you doing here, Holmes? I was worried, Watson, and with good reason it would appear. Go give the message to this policeman and let's go home. Nobody appreciates me hanging around here, you know, and it's freezing cold. Ah, Cradle, none too soon. You will take the testimony of this. No, you continue with your duty shift. I must find Chowder in Ambry Street. He struck again. Who? The murderer, the Bucks Row assassin. Hanbury Street. Let's go, Watson. We have no time to lose. Oh, God. Can I go back to the clinic and tell him? I have no reason to go that way. Okay. Um. Where am I supposed to go? Okay. Oh, there. 
Hanbury Street. Let's go, Watson. We have no time to lose. All right, I... Where's the cat's meat? What are we doing, Holmes? I, uh, I've been playing for two hours, so that's definitely enough for a part one anyway. I don't know if I'm going to do a part two. Uh, I am going to save it here, though. Uh, it's rough. Uh, it's rough, I'm not going to lie. Um, 2009. The graphics are, are not great. I could deal with that. But it's also really rough. Uh, I don't feel very invested or entertained. Uh, I, I don't really feel like I've had to figure anything out. It's just kind of fetch quests. So... Um... I'll think about it, and maybe we'll do a part two. I think what I'm going to do is I might check and see about how long this game is. If it's going to be like a six-part slog to finish this, I'm not going to bother. But if I can do it in another part or two, maybe I will. So either I will move on to the newly released Sherlock Holmes The Awakened or Awakening or something like that, uh, or I'll be back with another part of this, but in the meantime, you have yourself a nice day, take care, and I'll see you next time.